We return to the confirmation hearing of Brett Kavanaugh to be the next Supreme Court justice. It was another day of discord, this time centering on abortion and race. Democra Democrats publicly released a few dozen of Judge Kavanaugh's documents and emails from his time in the George W. Bush administration. A lawyer for President Bush had previously deemed those emails confidential, meaning senators could read but not talk about them. The release also sparked a heated exchange among senators. I'm going to release the email about racial profiling, and I understand that, that the penalty comes with potential ousting from the Senate. I'm releasing it to expose that, number one, the emails are being withheld from the public, have nothing to do with national security, nothing to jeopardize the sanctity of those ideals that I hold dear. Running for president is no excuse for violating the rules of the Senate or of the confidentiality of the documents that we, that we are privy to. No senator deserves to sit on this committee or serve in the Senate, in my view, if they decide to be a law unto themselves and willingly flout the rules of the Senate and the determination of confidentiality and classification. It's called the Presidential Records Act. That's the demon that you're after here. Th that is the only reason we've got this issue. Now, the custodian of those documents holds and exercises a privilege on behalf of the Bush administration. The custodian of those records has agreed, notwithstanding the privileged nature, nature of those documents, to hand them over to us with an understanding that when there is a need that arises with respect to one or more of those documents to make them public, uh, we can, as a committee, go through a process to do that. There is no Senate rule that, that I violated because there's no Senate rule that accounts for this process. I will say that I did willingly violate the chair's rule on the committee confidential process. Uh, I take full responsibility for violating that, sir. And I violate it because I, I sincerely believe that the public deserves to know this nominee's record. May I read the uh, Senate Rule 29-5, the standing rules of the Senate for the benefit of all senators. Any senator, officer, or employee of the Senate who shall disclose the secret or confidential business or proceedings of the Senate, including the business and proceedings of the committees, subcommittees, and offices of the Senate, shall be liable, if a senator, to suffer expulsion from the body and if an officer or employee to dismissal from the service of the Senate and to punishment or contempt. So I would, uh, I would uh, correct the senator's statement. There is no rule. There is clearly a rule uh, that applies. Then apply Mr. the rule Chairman. and bring the charges. Mr. Bring. Chairman. And that is where we will start our analysis of day three of this marathon hearing. Our own Lisa Desjardins has been in the hearing room all week. She joins us from Capitol Hill. NewsHour regular Marsha Coyle covers the court for the National Law Journal. Paul Clement served as U.S. Solicitor General under President George W. Bush. And Neil Katyal, he was acting Solicitor General in the Obama administration. He joins us from New York. Welcome to all of you. And Lisa, I'm going to come to you first because just fill us in, if you will, briefly on what was going on overnight that led to the release of some of these documents that this argument started about earlier. Simply, Judy, Democrats, including Senator Booker, actually requested that the documents, which had previously been confidential, be allowed to be made public. That is something they had not requested until last night. They did. They did it late. And through the night, uh, committee staffers, along with staffers for George W. Bush, his attorneys, and the Department of Justice worked through those documents. And by about 4 a.m., they were able to clear them for public release. By the time the committee met this morning and had that whole back and forth and kerfuffle, the documents that Cory Booker was talking about were, in fact, no longer committee confidential. So there was no breaking of the rules today. But, Judy, I think what you saw was a bigger battle over the image for both parties. Democrats felt like they had some ground to stand on based on these emails, one of which dealt with racial profiling, another with abortion, to say, hey, there is something in these documents worth talking about that we couldn't talk about before. Republicans acted quickly because they did not want to look like they had anything to hide. Marsha Coyle, why did it matter in the end whether this material was made public or not? Well, I think because uh, it, at least from the Democrats' perspective, the Senate Democrats' perspective, it, it did open some 
additional lines of questioning about Judge Kavanaugh's views on uh, abortion, affirmative action, uh, and uh, race in general. So. Um, I don't know that the, the the politics are all that important, but uh, I I think it was in, it was just another avenue in which they could uh, try to gain more insight into his views on those uh, issues in particular. Neil County, I'm I'm sorry, Paul Clement. There was a back and forth uh, yesterday and today over who was responsible for deciding what was released and what wasn't. Was it in the interest of the Bush administration in some way to keep this material or so, or, and frankly, so many pages of documents still under seal? I don't think that it was in the interest of the Bush administration necessarily to keep this material confidential. Obviously, there is a process under the Presidential Records Act, and I think there are important reasons why that process should be uh, followed. I think the key thing, though, is the one person who wasn't responsible for uh, keeping these documents from the public was Judge Kavanaugh. And so in some ways, I think all of these procedural sideshows uh, probably work to his benefit because he's not the one that has sort of kept these documents away from people. And this is really sort of a fight between the Democrats and the Republicans on the Senate Judiciary Committee. So, Neil Cattial, uh, at the end of the day, having now had a look, uh, d giving Democrats and the public a look at this, do we come away with, uh, with any sort of different perception of this uh, nominee? I, th I think we do. And so, you know, I agree with Paul. We don't know whether it's in the interest of the Bush administration, but it's really not in the interest of Judge Kavanaugh to have 100,000 pages of documents still withheld, even at this moment, and many pages dumped just a little while ago, and some dumped, as you said, at 4 a.m. And, you, you know, M Senator McConnell warned President Trump and said, look, if you nominate Judge Kavanaugh and you want to have a rush hearing, it's going to be a problem because of the oh, vast okay, number of documents. Yeah, right and when you've held a document like this, like, you know, the ones today were not classified or anything like that. They're things about, like, abortion. It looks fishy. It looks like there's something to hide, even when there very well may be nothing to hide. But here we are on day three. We still haven't gotten all the documents. They're trickling out, but there's still 100,000 pages being withheld. And I think, you know, uh, it looks particularly suspicious when the rules that Senator Grassley insisted on and Senator Cornyn with respect to Kagan, they are now throwing that rule book entirely out and saying, oh, we don't need all the documents. All right. Well, let's let's get a sense of what more uh, Judge Kavanaugh was asked today. We're going to play now a little bit of sound and more sound from today's hearing. This exchange with Democratic ranking member Dianne Feinstein is about a 2003 email from the George W. Bush White House in which Judge Kavanaugh questioned if Roe versus Wade is set a law or if other ju judges would overturn it. Tell us why you believe Roe is settled law. And if you could, do you believe it is correctly settled? Roe v. Wade is an important precedent of the Supreme Court. It's been reaffirmed many times. It was reaffirmed in Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992 when the court specifically considered whether to reaffirm it or whether to overturn it. In that case, in great detail, the three justice opinion of Justice Kennedy, Justice Souter, and Justice O'Connor went through all the factors, the stare decisis factors, analyzed those, and decided to reaffirm Roe. So you believe it's correctly settled, but is it correct law in your view? Just the whole body of modern Supreme Court case law, I have to follow what the nominees who've been in this seat before have done. Judge, a yes or a no will do. Well, I'm uh, just if I can briefly explain. Yes, you that, can. Brie course, briefly, I'll try to be brief. But uh, this, when you're in this seat, I'm not just sitting here for myself. I'm sitting here as a representative of the judiciary and and the obligation to preserve the independence of the judiciary, which I know you care deeply about. And so, one of the things I've done is studied very carefully what nominees have done in the past, what I've referred to as nominee precedent. And uh, Justice Ginsburg, but really all the justices, have not given hints or forecasts or previews. And Justice Kagan, I think, captured it well, as she often does, with in talking about questions like the one you're asking, she, you can't give a thumbs up or thumbs down and uh, maintain the independence of the judiciary. So I need to follow that nominee precedent here. So, Marsha Coyle, Judge Kavanaugh is saying, I'm simply doing what the other justices who are now sitting on the court have done when they were asked these questions.
there was uh, there's been considerable confusion over the last three days about what he may mean by settled law. And uh, when the email from the time he was in the White House came out in which uh, he was responding to a statement that was being drafted in support of another judicial nominee, the statement said something to the effect that all legal scholars agree that Roe is settled law. And he, and he, uh, and he said, uh, no, you know, I, I don't think you know, that you can say that Roe is settled law, that all legal scholars agree that Roe is settled law because there are at least three justices who may be inclined to overturn it. So that just prompted a whole series of questions. Did he believe it was settled law or not? That email response really didn't reflect what he thought. So he had to explain, you know, settled law, precedent, you know, how, how do you distinguish between the two? And he did point out that there are certain uh, decisions of the Supreme Court, the historical decisions, involving issues that are unlikely to come before the court again, such as uh, school, C school segregation, Brown versus Board of Education, that he felt he could say that that was correctly decided, that is settled law. But he said there's also a whole body of Supreme Court decisions precedents that could come back to the Supreme Court. And so he was following what other nominees had said that he cannot comment. Paul Clement, what was the ri what would be the risk in his going on, uh, going ahead and saying, yes, I think this was correctly settled, unless he doesn't believe it, in which case uh, you have a different situation? Oh, I, I think the risks are quite considerable, and that's why I think Judge Kavanaugh invoked the nominee precedents. I think every person who sat in that seat in the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing room has perceived that if you start saying, even as to an innocuous precedent that you think is correctly decided, that, okay, that one's correctly decided, then you've sort of opened it up to answer that question about every one of the cases. And then when you get, if you are confirmed, on the court, then you're in a position where People are literally going to be citing your Senate Judiciary Committee testimony uh, in briefs to the court and suggesting that you are hemmed in. So I, I, I do think that he's correct to invoke the precedent of Judge Sotomayor when she was judge and not yet Justice Sotomayor, uh, Solicitor General Kagan when she was before the committee. I think invoking that precedent is both a good tactic for present purposes, but I think it also gets at something very important and is ultimately correct. So, Neil Cattiall, did we get as much as we were likely to get <laughs> from uh, from Judge Kavanaugh today? Well, I was a little surprised that the answer wasn't a bit more fulsome. A after all, you know, Justice Ginsburg certainly answered the question about Roe at her hearings. Even Judge Kavanaugh answered questions about whether Brown was rightly decided or not and some other cases. And, you know, this is not a usual nomination. This is a nomination by a president who campaigned and promised that he would appoint pro-life justices, two or three, that would, quote, overturn Roe. And we heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it again until the Justice Kennedy vacancy. And then all of a sudden, it disappears. And that's why I think the email today was significant, because it does suggest that Judge Kavanaugh has a different view of whether or not he would be able to and would be willing to overturn settled precedent. Now, again, maybe there's nothing there, but it looks fishy to have these documents coming out on day three of the hearing. They were marked confidential before. There's nothing classified in them. This is not a good process. And there's just one more clip we want to play from today's hearing. This is when Delaware Democratic Senator Chris Coons was questioning Judge Kavanaugh's views on presidential power. I simply wish you would be clear with us and the American people about your view of the scope of presidential power and what its consequences might be. I don't think you're being direct with me about that because I think to be direct with me about that in this context would put your nomination at risk. I respectfully disagree, Senator. You're talking about a statute that has been not existed for 20 years. I've That's no longer what I'm talking about, Your Honor. As me, you know, what I'm talking about yeah. is your view of presidential power as made clear in speeches and in writings and in a decision this year. We're not talking about the independent counsel statute now. We're talking about the scope of presidential authority. And I think it has consequences for our nation. Respectfully, I believe you're uh, talking about a statute that uh, has not been in place uh, since 1999. Secondly, the special counsel system I've specifically written about multiple times and approved. Thirdly, if there were some kind of protection 
uh, for cause protection or some other kind of protection that were different from the old independent counsel statute, I've said that I would keep an open mind about that. So I have not said anything to rule that out. And I've referred to U.S. v. Nixon as one of the greatest decisions in uh, Supreme Court history. Now, since that has happened, uh, and that happened uh, about an hour or so ago, the hearing has continued, and I am told in the last few minutes, Judge Kavanaugh has said uh, under questioning that he would not recuse himself if there were any Mueller case, any legal case, that did reach the Supreme Court were he to be confirmed. Lisa, this is something Democrats have wanted to get at, is it not? That's right. And to be honest, I'm surprised that it took this long for them to ask that question. I was speaking to Dem number two Democrat in the Senate, Dick Durbin, three days ago. And that was one of the, the very first things he spoke of, was asking that recusal question. That's a very important answer. We're going to hear a lot more about it, I think, from Democrats. Marsha Coyle, uh, just to, for a quick go-around here at the end, that's, that's a, a significant statement on his part, isn't it? Yes. And, uh, but I think... Um, it would not be unusual for a nominee to say that because uh, they they realize that the Supreme Court, when a, a justice recuses, it's the court is left with eight justices and uh, there's difficulty in, in reaching a decision at that point. I think Judge Kavanaugh had been asked this before, and I, I think he said it, it would depend on what the case, you know, the issues in the case. Uh, he, he said he would follow the Judicial Code's uh, guidance on recusal in making that decision. Uh, he, he also made clear... Oh, go ahead, Judy. I'm, no, I'm, you know, I just ahead, wanted to say uh, on the presidential power issue, right. he also made it really clear that if there were a court order telling the president to do something or not to do something, that that would be the final word. And as far as... Uh, uh, the president taking some action to remove the special counsel. As you heard in the clip, he said he would keep an open mind uh, on uh, what that the special counsel regulations as well as what Congress has said about removal. All of that especially matters right now, Paul Clement, because of what's been going on with the special counsel. What do we finally take away with, with regard to his views on presidential power? Well, I think what he's trying to do here is he's trying not to prejudge any of these issues, and that goes to the merits of an issue like abortion or a particular executive power issue that could come up, and nobody knows exactly the precise context or which issue would come up. I think he's trying to preserve his ability to decide those issues when they do come up, and I think that goes even to the question of whether he could recuse himself or would need to recuse himself. I don't, I don't read him as saying he would never, you know, he would absolutely never recuse himself. I think he wants to keep an open mind and apply the standards that would normally be applied by a justice in that situation. And finally, Neil Cadial, just quickly, uh, how, what do you what do you take away in terms of his views of presidential power? There is Judy a bombshell in that answer. Uh, he said that he would approved the special counsel regulations in that answer in that clip that you provided. Now, yesterday, when asked about race and abortion and affirmative action and consumer protection, he said, "I can't tell you about those hypothetical cases because they could be pending in my court." But the, probably the most significant case currently pending in his court, the D.C. Circuit, is about the legality of the special counsel regulations. It's challenged by Concord and the Manafort Associates and the like. And he provided an answer there. And so I suspect the rest of the hearing is going to focus on that and say, look, if you can answer that question about a pending case in your court, how can you not answer all of these other questions? A number of questions uh, still there. The hearing continues into tonight. We'll be monitoring it all. I want to thank all of our guests, Neil Cattial, Paul Clement, Marsha Coyle, Lisa Desjardins. Thank you.